Hi. I'll wait for me. That would be great. Okay. okay. That works for you. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Alex will come. I mean, they'll come uh, when they come. They'll, they'll, they'll see if I can handle ah, these numbers. <laughs> it's just numbers. <laughs> Yeah, Mayor's true. going rogue on staff. He's <laughs> really outnumbered. <laughs> it's okay. We've done worse. Uh, let me make um, a philosophical point, if I can. Uh, that's not, but this budget manifests it. But it's actually, if you look at all, a this is the third budget, but all consistent with what I have uh, both said I would do, and then what we have done in each budget in one version or another. But it's done it. Um, Obviously, all of them are, uh, all three budgets are balanced, three years in a row. No property sales or gas tax increase. Each year, we put money in the rainy day fund, and as you noted, we now have a policy to make that a regular piece of the fiscal discipline. And each year, we did do it with any gimmicks, or rating the rainy day fund. And fourth, more importantly for me at least, while we make all those tough decisions, we've also increased investments in what are key things for the city's economy. First and foremost, children. Second, neighborhood services. Third, our small businesses to keep them vibrant and growing. Uh, but the way we've done it, the way we've balanced a budget without increasing property sales or gas tax any time for the last three years, was following what I believe is a reform and invest strategy. Now, I gave some examples, but there's lots of them. We changed our federally our, federal, our, our community health care clinics, put them with federally qualified entities. We've actually are seeing more people at different longer hours, like Saturday they're open where they weren't before, and at a saving of not $10 million, but $12 million to taxpayers. It's better health care, more savings. Grid garbage, we've now gone save money, put it into recycling, and rather than a new fee, we got a new service for the, uh, without increasing fees. That's throughout the city. And I can go to other things, small businesses, other places where we've made reforms and improved, in my view, uh, services. Not only is garbage on a grid system, we've done that and found efficiencies while we're increasing revenue on graffiti removal, on tree, remo uh, tree trimming. So we've done it in other areas. We've brought managed competition that is also beyond the grid garbage savings. It's brought the price down for providing the service of recycling. So those are examples of what I call a reform and invest uh, strategy uh, that I think has as a uh, as our beacon, our guiding light from a philosophical basis, and I think m while and those in, by getting rid of what I can the old politics, the debate, the era of kind of debating and di differing or rather deferring, finally making a decision, and I think whether you rely on the red line south or whether you rely on a community health care clinic, or uh, whether you wanted recycling. You're the beneficiary of getting out of politics and making some tough choices that actually started to provide services uh, and improvement in services that we had not seen before, or expanding services we never had in all the city. And that's just kind of a general kind of philosophical point. And uh, that uh, <coughs> I started without you, so hurry up. You should see what I said about the no, I'm joking. All the nice news is yeah. great. Yeah, wow. I'm not sure it was 100% correct. Mayor went rogue. <laughs> Go ahead. You were going to ask something. Um, I wanted to ask you how long you can postpone what I think might be the inevitable, and that is the need for an increase in the property tax given the city's looming pension liabilities. Well, uh, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not going to put a time frame. But I do think this, I don't think I can go back to the taxpayers. I don't think I was, I know I wasn't gonna do it in 2012, 2013, and 2014. So we haven't increased property sales or gas tax because I think there was some built up inefficiencies, political decisions that were made over the years that were very costly to taxpayers. And I wanted to attack those first because I think you have to prove that you're willing to take on the tough things, spend your political capital before you ask for more money from taxpayers. We had to change, you know, the grid garbage system. I mean, I know you guys, everybody kind of, oh, okay, well, we did it for 40 years one way because Alderman could have control of it. Putting it on this system saved us uh, resources and gave it into another service. And I think I had, and that was a case exactly where people said, let's charge everybody 10 bucks and that's how we'll pay for it. No. We're not going to charge people when we can make a, a, a tough decision. The aldermen weren't enthusiastic about the grid garbage at first. Now it's working. They're very enthusiastic about getting a new service, 
But that's kind of the give of what we've done. And I do think, uh, without talking about property taxes, as it relates to pensions, and uh, so one, I, let me back up one second, uh, one foot. I, uh, I want to be clear, I was not going to ask the taxpayers for anything new in a general revenue, property, sales, or gas, until we did the tough things ourselves first. Now that you've done those? And I don't, we're not done doing tough things. But I've been honest that from day one about pensions, it requires reform and revenue, not one or the other. You can't decouple them. And they got to become, they got to come together. You can't tax your way out of this. You can't reform your way out of this. They got to come together. And I've been disciplined about the budget stuff, knowing that one day when we deal with pensions, we're going to be having to ask more from everybody. You want to add anything? Okay. While we're still on philosophy, could you talk about your philosophy now about privatization and whether that has changed given your experience over the past year? Well, I kind of, can I ask you a question? Tell me about those glasses. <laughs> they're great. Do you like them? Yeah, what are they? It's, not, aren't they? it's a Belgian designer named Teo. <laughs> well, is Teo, did you Teo do the office? <laughs> 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 Sorry, okay, back to. That will be edited out. No. <laughs> well, say a little Teo for me, will you? Okay. I'll, I'll send you a link to okay. <laughs> They didn't do, do too good in World War I and II, mm -hmm. okay, the Belgians. Uh, let me. Um, well, let me do uh, a couple things. Take a wide lens. One is, I think you probably saw a piece I wrote, but I laid out five principles as it relates to changing or dealing with, uh, you say privatization, whether it's leasing or whatever. What are the principles that have to be about? And I'd rather than take time, they're spelled out, just take it. First and foremost, while we dealt specifically with the furlough, labor did come up and say, we're going to now deal with managed competition. We think we can win. We brought competition to recycling. Uh, waste management has a X amount of the city, maybe 50%. Streets and sanitation has another. And then there's a smaller firm, Sim or something like that, has uh, like a, a 10%, let's just say. I mean, I don't know. And everybody thought after six months, one person would get the whole thing. I said, no, we're going to keep competition in place. I want to keep everybody honest. And the only way to do that is competition. There have been other services, and everybody thought it was about labor. We set it up in the professional services, in the corp council and outside council. So I've kept, I've expanded it to what nobody really envisioned. So I, first of all, before, I know you're talking about uh, whether it's Midway or uh, uh, other entities, I have been rigorous about, we have actually um, in, in sourced or brought in what used to be private, where uh, uh, city employees have been more competitive from a price standpoint uh, and other services. So my general view is I want to get the best value for the taxpayers and uh, the residents. And I'm not philosophical whether it's private or public. I'm philosophical and determined on value. And that's what the best value service is for taxpayers. There's places where, like water, some stuff is done in-house, some stuff private. That's also true uh, as it relates to other uh, areas where we've made major infrastructure. On the principles, I don't think the city of Chicago's core proficiency is running a port. And I think we've showed it after 35 years. When your biggest asset is your golf course and you're a port, that's a problem. One. Two, and when Indiana's eating your lunch, that's a problem. Three, you can't do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. And 1983 was the last time you actually made a capital improvement. That's a problem. So we're going to run a process to figure out how best to manage this, not sell it manage it. I don't think the city of Chicago's core effectiveness, if you are the transportation distribution logistics center of the country, I always say Chicago's the inland port of America. 30% of all rail, air cargo, uh, traffic and road traffic runs through the city of Chicago. The port can be a contributor of both jobs to that strength. The reason I've made Olive Harvey the school right near it the Transportation Distribution Logistics School is because it's so integral to our economy and job growth. Uh, I've, you know, the port, as presently constructed, is not really getting value for the taxpayers and the people that rely on it for jobs. So, I've, But you have to do it in a thoughtful way. We all know the history. The parking meter uh, deal that was negotiated in the past was bad. People are sensitive. So anytime you have something, you've got to be thoughtful, give people time to look at it and evaluate it. 
could, uh, could we go back to pensions for a moment? Um, Say hello to Theo. I love that. That is, that's three interviews. That goes down as a classic. <laughs> um, are you making progress? Uh, you've put together the outlines of a program. You waited for Springfield to do something. Springfield so far hasn't done something. Um, and the cliff is getting closer and closer. Is this going to get solved? Do you want to say something you want me to I'll, I'll, Well, I'll, here's this. First of all, I'm not sure I, uh, uh, Greg, agree with the characterization that somehow I've been sitting back. Okay, and let me, uh, one, I bet, look, first, this problem was created over 30 years, not in two years. We inherited it. I announced in the campaign, it was very clear that we have to deal with this at some political risk. But I thought it was better to be honest and forthright with people than say, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. The Constitution will solve it. Two, Uninvited, but I did show up in Springfield, right. and I laid out not generalities, but a specific plan um, of what I thought was a, a balanced approach. And s you, since you are a good student to this, ever since that time, all of a sudden, COLA is a part of the discussion that they didn't exist before. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Okay. Third, I negotiated with the sergeants a plan <coughs> A, an agreement that I thought gave the sergeants certainty that they don't have today, taxpayers oh, certainty of what was expected of them in a way that it was responsible. Now I went down eight and one, but I did something in both cases. And then fourth, which is relevant here, I still think in a very responsible way I dealt with our health care costs as it relates to re early retirees and Medicare. Okay. One, anybody who's very old, the seniors, we don't touch them, don't, they're har held harmless. No, nothing will happen to change. We went from 200% of poverty to 250 as a relent also to cover more people. But we made sure we're in a transition phase because something that's cost us 110, 112 today quickly grows to 300 and did it in a responsible way that deals with the fiscal well-being of the city. So I've never sat back and I'm ready to work with anybody, as I said today, but doing it in a responsible fashion that partners reform with revenue, not one or the other, together. And I think the state showed having increased income taxes with no reform that have totally made their pension payments. Now look at the reform part, how's that going? So decoupling these, do you mean with one or putting all the burden on one, is a mistake. It's the wrong way to go. Yeah. And so. Uh, and I continue to stand ready, my administration does, to work with anybody who comes up with a balanced vote. <coughs> I think I showed the sergeants when uh, the president of the sergeants said I'm ready to work with them. We were very reasonable, in my view, and gave sergeants something they don't have today. And they still don't have it. Certainty. I understand. But is this going to get worked out in the next year? That is my hope. But do you think so? Well, I'm working towards it every day. I announced a, a, a plan to do that today. What are you going to do if it doesn't get worked out? You mm -hmm. seem to hint the, in the Tribune story that uh, uh, you'd like to defer payments. If, uh, you no, can't I didn't say that. I was going to have been stronger about what we're going to do and no, the consequences really of inaction. Talked about deferring payments. I mean, the, the point has been that current law, you know, Senate Bill 3538 just simply puts the revenue in and it doesn't deal with any of the reform, right? And so when we're talking about those two things, those two things have to go together so that they're sustainable not just for taxpayers, um, but they're also sustainable for employees and retirees, whether it's, you know, a change to that automatic raise every year, the COLA, or it's a change to the contributions that employees make, or it's retirement age, or it's choice for the, you know, youngest retiree, or youngest employees who may not want to stay with the city their entire career or even long enough to vest, um, that you've got to marry that and you've got to give a phase in for those folks because you don't want to just hit them right over the head because there are changes that they're going to have to face. But you also have to make it sustainable for taxpayers and you can't just drop, you know, a lump sum payment that has absolutely no reform attached to it onto taxpayers um, and make them come up with the dollars uh, you know, all at once. And so whether you, you can argue about whether that phase-in period is two years or five years or ten years or whatever it might be, but that's a very different conversation than talking about simply just delaying payments. All right. Or putting them on uh, just what you a, a freeze. I mean, every one of these talk about an increase, but in a way, in the same way, look at the sergeant deal or agreement we had. 
We said you had to work three more years, but did it in a gradual pace. And we said your contributions are. I'm saying the same thing for taxpayers. Don't kind of go from X to Y. You'll right. break. I mean, we got. What well, I hear you saying is that even if you had a deal, you'd have to phase in the, the revenue but, but, part of it. But I, I, right. I, but you have to do it in a way that's sustainable because this is bigger than a pension issue. Okay. Now, I, no, in this sense, Greg. Let me. I do one sense. This is all about the economy. It's not about a budget. The reason companies are moving here and people are moving back is we've shown good fiscal. One of the reasons is we, besides the best trained, educated workforce, modern infrastructure, we've shown fiscal discipline. One of the things that the economists noted about us in the public sector is that we actually do what we say we're going to do. If you raise taxes too fast, too quickly, I think all the gains we've made of people wanting to relocate here, expand here, will be at risk. And then your tax base is smaller, not bigger. And one of the things you need to contribute is a tax base. So between getting the uh, pensions on a sustainable path so they can meet their obligations and doing it in a way that doesn't wreck the economy, and I don't mean just the economy, I also mean the budgets of families, has to be balanced in a way so we can achieve one without expense at the other. What are you going to do? Springfield continues to do what it has been doing, which is nothing. Yeah, well, I, my belief is they're going to step up and uh, do what they need to do, and the city needs to be, and municipalities need to be part of it. What was your reaction to John Cullerton's comment that there wasn't a crisis? I, I think my speech speaks for itself, a sense of the urgency that uh, is needed. <coughs> What's your reaction to Bruce Rauner's statement that the, the cops uh, are a special case? They shouldn't have to uh, get the same reform that everybody else gets. Mm -hmm. well, I, I've, I've spoken to uh, making sure that we're respectful of everybody that's uh, made contributions, continues to make contributions. Look, I understand. Let me say this. We as a city negotiated something. The way the uh, formula works, the state, the city has not kept up. Every paycheck, a police officer, a firefighter, a teacher makes a contribution. We are asking them to make changes. Totally agree with that. But they too would live in the city, and they too would experience a property tax increase that's dramatic, and I know they don't want that. So that's why I'm asking for a balanced approach. You implied before, I just want to make sure I heard correctly what you were if saying. If I implied it, then I was right. trying to be very subtle. Uh, so well, I think that's I, a that's fair right, And that's a Belgian to answer to a very <laughs> Belgian question. <laughs> do, you, are, do you mean to suggest that if you get a deal, a property tax increases potentially on the table. I said revenue, I, I, that's all I said. What other revenue could it be? But first of Sales all. Sales tax? No, I'm not going to. That's not how I'm going to do it, guys. I'm being honest that revenue is part of it. I can't predict, or I'm not going to predict, and it would be wrong, what the actual agreement is. But I know revenue is part of the solution, but it, ain't gonna, it is not the solution. It's part of a solution. The solution includes reform. As long as we're in Springfield. <coughs> um, ADM, as you know, is considering moving their headquarters up here. Mm -hmm. um, but they want some uh, state edge credits for it. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor says, not until we get pension reform. Some other people say, not ever. Um, if they can't get uh, the state incentives they're looking for, is the city prepared to step up to the table? Or TIF or something else? Yeah, well, I've been clear. I think we have three incredible, great incentives best trained and educated workforce in the country. 35% of the people in the city of Chicago has a four-year college degree. Nationwide, it's 27%. Uh -huh. You can't get, and we have the educational institutions, whether that's Booth, Kellogg, and all the other professional schools that people want. For their headquarters, we have more uh, great four-year institutions here, great four-year institutions in the state, more alumni from the Big Ten State Universities than any other city in America. Nobody will out-educate the city of Chicago. Two. We have the best transportation, world-class transportation system. Our airport, O'Hare, plus our airports, airport, Midway and O'Hare, is the best connected airport and air traffic, air, airport system in the country. There is no, if you're a company like ADM with worldwide uh, footprint, you can get anywhere in America, anywhere in the world directly on a daily basis. And nobody can compete. Not Minneapolis, not St. Louis. Second, or third, we have a world-class city with a world-class cultural en uh, environment, whether it's your hotels, whether it's your restaurants, whether it's your cultural scene, number one art institute, number one museum in the country, number three in the world, art institute. Theater, as many Tony Award winning theater companies as New York. Our incentive is, and we've compared ourselves, Chicago versus Minneapolis, St. Louis, beat them on every level, and not close, 
We're not first by margin. We're first by miles. And that's our incentive. And we think we're in a good position. We think Chicago is the right choice. So no tip. What I'm saying is I, I laid out the three incentives that I think are key. When Steve asked about the, uh, the port. You, well, he asked about privatization. I assume Right, but then you, you got to right. the port. It, I take it then that you're, you're still interested in privatizing or finding somebody else to run the port. That's a loaded term. Uh, but yeah, I got it. I'm but, joking. Go ahead. But uh, where are we with that? Uh, you know, that active discussions um, uh, with parties that are interested in uh, who are proficient as a core part of what they do run an integrated port system. It's not just a port. It's a rail system that moves from the port goods and services out. There are people that do it for a living. That's all they do. And we're in discussions with them. Does that include the, the party that walked away? It includes a lot of people. <coughs> because we had a number of people show up and it still includes a number of people. We don't have an exclusive anymore with just the bro group as we did in the past. What's the timetable on that? One, I think we have a good deal that stands up to light of day that meets what uh, both the job growth and taxpayer uh, needs that we accept out. You put a, I, I, let me say one thing, uh, and I'm going to be clear from my negotiating position. No deal is always better than a bad deal. I don't have to do it. I think it's the right thing to do because we have not produced economically from the port the jobs and economic growth that is key for the city. It's something that's, fun, that's a strength, but unfortunately we're losing that to Indiana. It's got to get under better management. But that said, given that it's not for one year, it's not for 10 years, it's not for 20 years, it's for some time, a good deal is better than a bad deal, and no deal is better than a bad deal. I will not agree to a deal, and I think we should all, the parking meter deal was a bad deal by a factor of 100. I walked away because I didn't think Midway was right. And I'm having the willingness to walk away when I don't think the port's right. No deal is always better than a bad deal. And people will know when somebody is serious. They may have thought in the past, because of what happened in the parking meter, the city's in a position that we just walk all over them. I'm not letting anybody walk over the taxpayers of the city of Chicago, ever. Uh, one deal you put an awful lot of time and effort on was Wrigley Field. A mm -hmm. um, uh, lot of talks, a lot of compromise, <coughs> some more legislation recently, but... Uh, well, that was expected, that you had to do to clean up some stuff. Uh, but correct. Stuff. But you know, here we are, a month after uh, the last game, no permits, no work. The team says they're not going to do anything until uh, nice. they get they get the promise. The rooftop guys say they ain't going to get the promise until they get something at the back end. Yeah. Is this going to get worked out? Yes, it's going to get worked out because it's in everybody's self-interest. First of all, what won't be held up is the investments in the neighborhood, whether they're around security, transportation, and investments in the parks that are uh, they committed to. Second, I think it's a balanced approach, and I want everybody to uh, uh, hold up their side of the bargain. And I understand why uh, the owners of the team want certainty, and uh, the rooftops uh, have done, had had some certainty, and they need to step up. I expect everybody to resolve their differences on behalf of the common good. And how is, what's the logical resolution? Well, th those parties are having a, a healthy discussion. Are they? My impression is they're not talking at all. Uh, well, you've got a wrong impression. Okay. Maybe you should have him get him some Theo glasses <laughs> so he has better eyesight. That was, oh, don't get all upset. <laughs> Does Theo make hearing aids? I'm just telling you what to, I'm just telling you what to tell me. Okay. Can I shift gears sure. to, uh, uh, to crime? Um, yes. New York City, more than three times as big as Chicago, went seven days without a single homicide. We're lucky to go one day without a single homicide. What's wrong with Chicago? Well, uh, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say what's wrong. I understand what you mean, but I don't agree with the framing of the question. I actually think there is something wrong with the city of Chicago that we no. can't go more than a day without somebody getting no, I think there, I think there are some things that are working, and we need to make sure that they're extended throughout. Um, I laid it out very specifically in the speech is what I call about the four P's. There's policing, there's prevention, there's penalties, and there's parenting. And in each of those areas, policing, we took cops from behind the desks that were being paid uh, to do uh, administrative work and put them on the street, so they're actually securing our streets. And the reason last year you had a 9% reduction in crime, and this year you have a 14.5% reduction in crime. 
more cops are on the street because of what we did in better management. Two, we did an audit of the gangs and we have more information dealing with the reprisal shootings. Three, we did impact zones and flooded the areas uh, with foot patrol. So there's a series of things we're constantly doing. Uh, if I can have my black book. Uh, one, uh, second, is you know what my view is about prevention. I was extensive about both summer jobs as well as uh, uh, what I believe after school programs, summer jobs that are great for prevention, become a man. I want to show you this. This is what the federal government used to do. This is what the city did on summer jobs. This is where the federal government is today. This is where the city is. We have actually made up ground and they have uh, walked away. Head Start, $7 million left. After school programs, same thing, where they have stepped down from their responsibility. This is after school, where the city has dramatically increased its piece, even though they've been on a downward slope. They've walked away from our children. Now, you need prevention to make this work for everybody. I believe the weak link for the city of Chicago. If you are pulling off the streets of the city of Chicago more guns than any other city, New York or LA combined, we have a gun problem in the wrong hands of the people. We've also, and I want to say beyond the after school and summer jobs and early childhood and all the other stuff, with Become a Man and One Summer Plus, we're investing in giving these young men a grounding that has been absent their lives. A counselor, a mentor, and it's proven tremendously successful because they have not received up until this point the moral grounding they need. So we're backing up where there has been parenting missing in their lives. Finally, as I said, we pull more guns off the street than any other city and New York and LA combined. Now, I don't believe it's only about penalties, although I do believe that the gun penalties should be more than shoplifting and illegal selling of cigarettes, which they are today, because they're not an effective deterrent. I also believe in changing it, so we change our marijuana laws, so we're not arresting minor offenses. 1,200 plus people in the criminal justice system. We're dealing with recidivism. We reserve jobs at the CTA cleaning the buses and trains just for people to break the cycle of recidivism. We have made sure that 2,000 uh, 2, nonviolent youth get job training and education rather than prison time. But we need stiffer penalties. Now what Chicago has, and New York has the three year, I'd like us to have it because I think it's the right way to send a clear and unambiguous deterrent message. You will do the time for the crime. But more importantly, or in addition, not more importantly, New York enjoys the benefits of New Jersey and Connecticut's gun laws. We are adjacent to Indiana and Wisconsin with a different set of laws. It impacts, given that guns don't just stay where they are, they flow. The reason we're taking more guns off the streets of the city of Chicago than either New York or LA is because of our proximity to states that have different gun laws and a different gun culture, which is why I've asked for a universal background check. Not just asked, fought for it. So we have a challenge, and it's what I said today is what I believe. As it relates to public safety, we're a tale of two cities, and I'm not gonna rest until we have one city <coughs> as it relates to public safety, regardless of neighborhood, regardless of zip code, and regardless of income. There was a recent report that suggested that uh, the tale of two cities doesn't just doesn't only apply to uh, to public safety; it applies to jobs. Uh, the study specifically found that uh, in the last decade, roughly, even I read though, it. Even I read though, your article. Yeah, I mean, is it believable that there are fewer African Americans from Chicago who worked downtown than ten years ago? And if so, why? Well, I I, I don't know, if, but let me say the one thing I do know you need to do, which we're doing. I could have done the red line over four and a half years, but I think in five months we've given people from the south side access to the, where the job growth has been. And we did it, but now a lot of people thought it was, oh, it's too fast. Well, all the stations got fixed, all the railways got fixed, and they did it on time, on budget, and people are experiencing it within five months, not four years. Second is we dramatically changed our community college system, so it's not the last year of a remedial education, but it's the first year on your way to a college, to an education and skills. The World Bank just came out with a report saying Chicago's college career program is the exact model for a skilled workforce. And you give people, regardless of where they live, whether it's Austin 
Garfield, Auburn Gresham, Chatham, Roseland, South Shore, Independence Park, Ravenswood, I don't care where they live. You give them a <coughs> two years minimal of education post high school and you're giving them the best ticket towards uh, employment so they can experience the growth as your own magazine, as I cited it today, I hope you know. No, because Chicago has the fastest growing central business district in the country by a factor of two over number of the second. So the dyna dynamics that you're seeing here, I want to A, with my small business plan, making sure it's throughout the city. But that said, the way I know to make sure that regardless of where you live, you can participate in that dynamic experience is through an education and through a modern transportation system. And we have made significant uh, down payment on both of them, not just rhetorically, but with bold action. One is being now noted by the World Bank, the second, the red line, while well, some people argue, you know, five months, what are you doing shutting down a system? On time, on budget. In fact, it was so good, the buses, people wanted the buses to stay. We're going to have a high time getting back to the trains. But that tells, but that, that is the ticket. And the people that built it was 1,500, a lot of it from people that uh, come from the community and also the contracting. Uh, I did read both articles. And it's also why we're making all the changes that I think are essential to any education which is why I've set the goal for the city, 100% college ready, 100% college bound. We do that, regardless of where you live, you'll have a chance of participating in the future of this great city. What do, what do we do with uh, these neighborhoods that are really emptied out, where we've got just block after block of vacant land, or you know, there's one home left standing? How do we re reclaim that and put that well, back in the tax rolls? You should, uh, I mean, I, this is a longer discussion, but we really should look at what we've done on Neighborhood Now. We've targeted seven neighborhoods. Uh, take, you know, I'll just, we'll take uh, the uh, Pullman. I believe the reason you can generate private sector investment is because we're willing to do certain things to the public that become a multiplier. I don't mean to talk about it technically, but it gives people confidence. Since we've done certain things on Olive Harvey is right next to Pullman, we've turned it in transportation, distribution, logistics. We've invested in water, infrastructure, road infrastructure, lighting, other things. Walmart's there, opened. It was an incredible opening, 400 plus jobs. Method is moving their modern first factory in the United States they're gonna run to Pullman. Um, there are other uh, restaurants looking now and other type of retail in conversation with us because of our investment on the public side. That's also true in uh, uh, Brownsville. It's also true in uh, other communities that we are targeting to kind of jumpstart the economic development. I'm just giving you two rather than run through all seven. But in every one of them you can find private sector st uh, investment starting to pick up because the public sector has taken the lead. And I think having a strategy where, uh, I don't mean to use a biking term, where we draft behind, but the public sector leads, jump starts the investment. I caught you yawning during the middle of my answer. Uh, and gives the confidence for the private sector to say, okay, we're gonna open up a store here. We're gonna move a factory here. That's what you do. But I still believe, I know, you know, a good education is a passport to get a job anywhere doesn't limit you to where you live. That's why it's so essential to do what we're doing on either K through 12 or 12 through 14. We've made comprehensive investments in pre-K, full day kindergarten, full day school, after school programming, summer jobs, library, community college, college career, all in the effort and it's all being noted and recognized. We have a lot of work ahead of us, we're not done but how to make sure that people are educated and skill ready because we live in an era where you earn what you learn. And the only way to get people, regardless of where they live, the jobs that I think are there and to turn a community around is through education and transportation. We're doing things on the small business side as you probably can see, I assume you have the speech that we've laid out that are now becoming, we just had a conference two, two months ago, yeah, yeah uh, 20 s small business uh, people from around 20 different cities came to follow what we were doing with the one business, one, one small business uh, job center. So I think we're, we have a lot of work to do, a lot of things to learn, but I think we're doing the right thing. Do you want to add something? Okay. Um, 
Can I ask about Pullman? Um, sure. Because we're, we're actually working on a little piece. Um, Nothing the, you guys write is little, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the, the National Park uh, mm -hmm. designation, have mm -hmm. you been pushing for that? Have you been making any calls to your I, Not just calls. I, um, boss? Uh, I met with the, um, the Secretary of Interior when she was a Secretary of Interior designate. Mm -hmm. I met with her, in fact, the weekend I went out for the White House uh, press corps dinner uh, in May. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been working with both senators' uh, offices and when we pushed the legislation, and I'm eager to get that uh, designate. We cleared one hurdle already, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it will be, it's, those are the type of things that would actually only entice, and we have some other things we'll be doing in short order in the community as it relates to uh, park investment. Mm -hmm. okay. In and around there, you are. Right but I'm very excited about it because it would be one. It would be a, a real great recognition and put it on the map for a whole host of economic uh, growth that it doesn't have today, or complement the other growth that we're doing. That we need. Um, you've been without a controller for a while. How is that process of finding a replacement coming? Good. Soon. <laughs> Close. Yeah. Okay. Care to name a name? Nope. Um, We're in the final stages, let's just say that. In the okay. final stages. Yes, very close. Um, Sarah wanted me to stay with, yep, nope, yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're, uh, you're I went out on, on, a, on a related subject. Yeah. Uh, your, your, your chief financial officer is not here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anybody that I'm aware of saw her today. You probably did. Um, she was there. Does, uh, does she still have your full faith and confidence? All 1,000% of it, absolutely. I think Lois is doing a, a very good job. She has professionalized the CFO position. She's done a great job. It helped us when we renegotiate the parking meter deal so we get free Sundays back and, and the exposure of the city for north of a, a billion or north. Uh, and uh, she has 100%, 1,000%, any percentage you want to put of my confidence. She's done a great job. And I think uh, what goes on, what I've seen go on, uh, the reason I left Washington, Greg, is because I think Washington is just sport of character assassination. I saw it during the Clinton years. I saw it uh, in parts of Obama. I think that's wrong. I think people are serving in public service. Get, she clearly gave up something. She didn't have to do it. She has served ably and <coughs> continues to serve ably. And I'm not interested in participating in anything that uh, ruins people's reputation for sport. Um, one of the things that your friends in the uh, City Council's Reform Caucus came up with today is, uh, is we don't need any more taxes on regular Chicagoans, we need to tax these business guys who aren't paying their fair share. Um, understanding the competitive nature of the commodities and financial business, but also understanding that places like Singapore have started to examine this. Are there any conditions under which the City of Chicago would consider imposing some kind of transaction tax? No. I mean, first of all, that that businesses would leave the city because you could do that electronically. The days of it being on the floor are over. And there's too much competition around the world. And they are a huge job generator and economic activity for the uh, city. Okay. And I don't want to create, whether it's Singapore, London, Paris, when C in the Chicago Board of Options, Philadelphia, or, or any of the other purely electronic exchanges a disadvantage economically. People come to the city and move to the city because these, the, the industry, we are a worldwide cap, uh, capital for risk benefit, which is what Chicago Board of Options and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange done. Billions of dollars daily generated for the city. I think it's a mistake to see that business uh, move uh, overseas or to another city or to an ele a pure electronic exchange. And all of it can be done electronically. It no, it's given nothing's going on at the floor or you know very little, right. it's a mistake. It doesn't yeah. get harder to make that argument, though, with some cities appear to play footsie, at least with this idea? But they haven't done anything yet. Not yet. Well, how about this? If you move first, they'll definitely do it. Yes. That is, all the business will go there. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you another personal question on uh, the CTO? Uh, how no. quickly will there be a replacement for uh, John uh, Toller? Uh, we are closer on the controller than that. But, you know, John served ably for two years, came from the uh, private sector, and has uh, done a great job in modernizing our chief information slash technology officer in a great way. And I'm proud of his service. Thank him. Uh, he obviously wants to go on 
to other uh, things, uh, but there's plenty of people who want to, who are experts in this area, want to come. I can't thank John enough, as he knows, uh, but it's been very helpful to the city to take, and remember, part of the reforms and efficiencies we're finding that we are savings is because of the ideas that John Tolvin and his team have generated. Do you have any regrets about the DePaul deal? Uh, you've had a lot of flack for that, for rightly or wrongly. Well, here's the way I look at it, Greg. As you know in the speech, but it's a fact, you guys have covered this. When I came into office, Chicago was fifth in the convention industry. I negotiated to remove the legal uh, cloud that hung over McCormick Place with both the Carpenters and Teamsters individually, and you could talk to the presidents and they would tell you that. Since that time, since our costs have come down, since we now market labor and management on a single team, we've moved from fifth to second. For the first time in a decade or so, have paced, pa paced out, replaced Vegas. I'm not going to give up those hard-earned gains and fall back to the status quo of being fifth. Anybody wants to be comfortable with fifth, go ahead. There's 80,000 jobs in the city of Chicago that rely on a vibrant convention industry. Those are people who live in our city, pay taxes, work in our hotels, work at the convention center, work in our restaurants, and make sure that we have a vibrant. Now we move from fifth to second. In two years, doing something different rather than the old politics treating McCormick Place as another political sandbox. We <coughs> professionalized it. Now, one of the things that was necessary was creating a bigger hotel campus there because a lot of people wanted to be on site. We're going to do that. Two, to get more international travels, uh, we needed a uh, mass transit, not just a taxi system. That TIF is supporting a new CTA that not only station at CERMAC will not only support the convention, but support that neighborhoods in and around the Bronzeville area and Motor Row that never had it. Mm -hmm. And it will create great residential development. We're doing ma incredible investments in our parks there. The TIFs in and around there are also supporting the new Ch Chinatown Library. They helped build the Jones School. They helped build the, are building out the Jones uh, North, which we already turned out. And they helped the uh, local school with the teaching academy that also has two schools in it. I think we should do both. We should have a vibrant convention and tourism industry and a vibrant neighborhood under the south and bigger south loop, including Chinatown, South Loop, Motor Row. And all those investments are making sure that Chicago is not fifth, but second in the convention business and making sure one of the, when you reported one of the fastest growing central districts, the fastest growing central uh, business district in the country, you included South Loop in part of that. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. And because we're making the investments. And it's not an either or choice. We should do both. And we're going to do both. So, so uh, I'm hearing your answer that, that you see the DePaul Arena as part of the convention piece that you just described. Well, yeah, because, I mean, first of all, it, it's, I don't describe it's not DePaul, it's an event center. Right. But, it's I mean, gonna but you're aware, since you say you've followed our coverage, that we've reported that, there, that the number of conventions that are you know, appropriate for an arena of that size limited. No, yeah, but it is, well, it's, it serves for convention, but you know, one of the things that big conventions want, the big ones, is not just, yes, it opens up the medium and small convention business mm -hmm. that don't want to go into a 200,000 square foot cavernous area. So we have that facility. The other thing it offers is for the big conventions that want to do an entertainment so everybody gets around. It offers that facility that you don't have today. Uh, it offers in a venue for uh, concerts in the same way that other stadiums use it. So it's not for one thing, and DePaul's putting money up to play there for 24 nights. Does it provide a platform for a casino? Mm -hmm. First of all, you're getting the cart before the horse. We don't have any casino legislation to have a place to talk about a casino. Well, but you can imagine. No, you can imagine. I have to deal with reality. I don't, I don't have no. I don't. I don't have the liberty for imagining. Uh, this this might be a small point, but doesn't this new arena uh, event center with the UIC pavilion or the UIC arena? I mean, it's the same, basically the same size. We already have that facility. It's terribly underused. No, but why not just because this is for serves a multiple set of purposes, not one purpose. But do we run the risk of the state uh, competing with the city of 
shopping the same sort of venue. No, because McCormick Place is a joint, well, the city runs it, I mean, or the professional firm runs it. The state and the city have a uh, board appointees on it. And it's, like, and it's also 10,000 jobs will be, and it also, let me say this, because of the way we did it, the number one tourist attraction in the entire Midwest, which is Navy Pier, it freed up the funds to make the critical investments to do for the planning there that you could have done otherwise. So we're enhancing our tourism while we strengthen our convention business. That's what we're doing. I'm just wondering if, if poor UIC ends up getting sucked dry and has n no reason to have, even have that facility. Yeah. Well, uh, I, don't, I don't particularly see it that way. Um, and that's not the competition. That, uh, and it serves multiple purposes. And the UIC doesn't serve the convention industry, which this will. You're a, uh, you're a Democrat. <coughs> Do you uh, promise Wow. Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> You're welcome. Do you don't think either six years, seven years of Clinton, Congress, mm -hmm. Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Obama, of the president, that that would help? These me. days, I, these days I'd like to double check. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you promise that you will back the Democratic nominee for governor, even Absolutely. if the Republican running is is a buddy of yours? Sure. I'm a Democrat. I'm going to back the uh, the Democratic nominee, which will be Governor Quinn. I'm going to support him uh, for re-election. Why? And, you know, Bruce may be a friend, but we vigorously disagree about policy. So, Such as? Oh, a whole host of things that we disagree with. Like what? Well, our, our vision of government. Philosophically, I think, you know, he thinks government's the problem. I actually think properly focused government is a solution. I wouldn't be talking about what I'm talking about on education. I wouldn't be talking about what I'm talking about on infrastructure if I didn't see government as a way to, and my neighborhood now strategy or my one stop shop small business center. I think government properly focused on core capacities can be an incredible contributor to a productive economy that allows people to get jobs. And I've laid that out. So our, we, have we have always had philosophical differences and very particular policy differences uh, while he may be a friend we disagree, and I'm going to support Governor Quinn for his re-election. Back on. Well, let me say this: I endorse Diana Rauner. So she's a Democrat. <laughs> Back on the police matter, one one other thing I wanted to ask you about it, and that is. You did put a lot more police on the street flooding these zones, but a lot of that came by paying overtime to police yeah. to get them out. Can we continue to afford that sort of overtime? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. 2014, 15. Yeah, it's actually included in the budget. I think a couple of comments about the overtime. Um, first, uh, remember that the overtime numbers for the impact zone is a little bit higher this year because we started out with a full overtime plan and as the uh, recruits have been coming out of the academy, you know, we've had 740 of them coming out of the academy this year. Many of them have been going into those impact zones on straight time. That's really brought down our overtime number. Um, so next year we're assuming that we're going to continue the impact zones and that about half of it will be in overtime and the rest will continue our, uh, you know, recruits on the street, our new, uh, new recruits on the street. Uh, on straight time. But I think the other thing is is that you had to remember that overtime isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? It uh, is often cheaper and it's often a better management tool because an hour of overtime doesn't come with an hour of benefits. It doesn't have health care or pension or duty availability or a uniform allowance or baby furlough or furlough or any of those things that we pay um, a regular employee. And so an overtime hour of overtime is just a straight hour of wage. Um, and it also has more man management flexibility associated with it. So if you need, you know, 400 people or 200 people or 20 people um, in a particular place at a particular time, you can do that and you've got the flexibility to do it. Um, whereas if you needed those same 20 people you'd need and you wanted them on straight time, you'd need to hire, you know, two or three times the number because, you know, you've got different shifts and you've got a manning requirement. But I think the thing is, is that it's not just about police. It's also about the guys who fix our bridge or the people who are repairing our sewer lines or any of the other kinds of work that the city does. And having a regular overtime program is just uh, it's it's often more cost effective. One of the things, I jump-started the impact zone by making the decision to go to overtime. We had the largest recruitment class in kids, come, and kids uh, the, not kids, but coming out of the recruits at 741 since 2000. And as soon as they started coming out, we were putting them on the foot patrol, replacing all the overtime. 
Now all the foot patrol is regular officers. It's limited to the sergeants on the overtime. So we started something to get it going rather than kind of doing it one zone at a time. I wanted all 20 zones done at <coughs> once. So we started with it and then we've been rolling back each zone to where uh, August um, we were uh, at full, or August or September, but full, the foot patrols were just full from the recruits fresh. So it wasn't done by overtime. It was done by regular pay, regular officers on regular time. Is uh, anything going on at O'Hare in terms of uh, further discussions on finishing up the uh, OMP? Well, uh, you know, while we opened up the new runway, uh, we've taken a couple things that are further in, in the next stages. One, uh, uh, we secured $10 million to move forward, and the uh, two airlines came up with the other part to move Lima Lima, which is key for the next stage. Second, as you know, I pursued the uh, TIFIA grant that we now are going to do for the intermodal facility. That opens up more land that allows us to move for the next stage. So we're peeling back the pieces while we're running the airport to go to stage two. Obviously, the core part of this is uh, uh, us coming to an agreement with the airlines and the FAA. On the other hand, while we were doing the first, opening up this runway, we were doing the other pieces that get us uh, in the right place at the right time for stage two. And have the carriers said anything uh, promising? Well, I just, it's part of negotiations. Uh, I know it's frustrating for you guys. You have a job. Part of negotiations is trust. Part of making progress in negotiations is trust. I'm not going to do anything to violate the trust. You have your job to do, but I have my job to do. Was your letter today uh, endorsing the merger of American and U.S. Air, does that have anything to do with the OMP stuff? Well, I happen to think it's a... Uh, uh, the right thing to do, and I think a strong uh, new American airline is in our interest, given that they are supportive of what we're trying to do. Now, remember, O'Hare Airport is the only airport in all of North America that has both United and American fully operating on there. That gives us a huge strategic advantage. A week ago, cited in your magazine, O'Hare was rated as the best connected airport in America for world and domestic travel. Right. It is in our interest to have a strong competitive carrier to United. And I happen to think it's in our interest not just to unite it, but to keep O'Hare the best connected airport in the country. So when you ask me about an ADM, and I say we're the best we are of a modern transportation system, I can say it with full confidence. When I say that somebody wants to come from the coast and get here and get back home because they want to look at a new tech company, we have an airport system that gets it. That is key to the city of Chicago. And so I joined, uh, I don't know, was it nine or 10 other mayors? A number of other mayors who all have a self-interest also in seeing uh, the Justice Department's decision in the front of the court come out the other way. Right. Um, now that you've got the red line rebuilt, congratulations. Any progress on finding the money to extend it? No, we're working on We'll have more to say on transportation in the uh, weeks ahead. But you know I'm always doing transportation because it's key. Well, I, let me say this is, uh, I, I, you know, I think, this, I, I think it's really underappreciated in a sense. I mean, more people take the CTA of the city of Chicago in a single month than take all of Amtrak nationwide all year. Right. Okay. Uh, you close your mouth. That's not really good. So go down like that. <laughs> I was stunned. No, but yeah, well, I, when I, more people take our CTA in a single month than take Amtrak nationwide all year, even including the Northeast Corridor, okay? The busiest corridor for Amtrak. Now, when I got a congressman, the, one of the first things I did, working with then Mayor Daly, was secure the funding to modernize the Brown Line, which was the fastest growing, so the rail, so the platforms could go from six to eight cars. I have been. No, it's not up there with education and public safety, and rightfully so, but it is key to the city. And one of the things that we have done is modernize the system. We made major reforms in our central office and put that in every station, is either rehabbed, refurbished, or totally rebuilt. We have more stations right now being rebuilt than any other time in the city of Chicago. We got the CERMAC, 95th, Wilson, Loyola, Clark and Division, Morgan, all kind, more coming, all, and Washington Wabash. All the plans are out there. You can look at them all. 
plus all the other stuff that we have done to re rehab or refurbish the stations. More miles have been totally rebuilt. The red line being the most dramatic, which is 10.9 miles, totally rebuilt, but we're doing on the brown line and the blue line, sections of them. We're going, we have the RFP out to go 4G universal. We put bus trackers on all the system. Every bus and every train will be replaced in the next six years. No other city is doing what we're doing on the mass transit system. And two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, every director and boards of the mass transit systems throughout the country came to the city of Chicago on a conference but to see what we are doing. And so it's essential for the city's investments. We're going to continue to make investments. So whether you live on the south side and rely on the red line, the brown line and the northwest side, north side and the northwest side of the city of Chicago, the red purple line, you have a modern transportation system that you can stay in touch and work on while you get to work. Now I'm, obviously you can tell since I ride it twice a week, pretty passionate about this. But I can't tell you, and I've met with all the companies like United when they brought a thousand people addition to work here. I did a town hall. Close to 70% of them take mass transit to get to work. And it's unbelievably convenient and it's a selling point for the employers because their employees can work while they're also on the train. You're going to miss Ray, aren't you? A lot. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, He's done, he was, did a great job for America. Um, um, uh, in parts of America. Um, any... Uh, the central part. Any, <laughs> any, th any thoughts that your team has come up with on what you... What is this, 21 questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any thoughts yeah, yeah, on, what you're, on what you're... The, <laughs> you know me. Any thoughts your team has come up with on what to do with the Block 37 Superstation, which is... Quarter of a billion dollars and it's empty. No, well, uh, we got to get back to you on that. It would be the safest thing for today to say. Okay. okay. Does everybody know that problem? Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. We have some ideas that Jan. Um, <laughs> what do you propose, Jan? We solicited. And what do you think? Uh, oh gosh, what is it? Skateboard park, uh, <laughs> ice <laughs> rink. There are all kinds of crazy Disco. ideas. Circus arena, there. perhaps. Uh huh. Prison for. Oh, yeah. Uh, politicians? Politicians, too. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with pension. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. This is okay. deteriorating fast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.